Welcome to the MOOCs course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Natural Gas, LPG and Syngas. Before going into the details of production of uh, natural gas, uh, liquefied petroleum gas and syngas, what we are going to do now? We are going to have a kind of recapitulation of what we have seen in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we have seen introduction of fuel and industrial gases. Then again we have seen a few details of uh, like raw materials, manufacturing processes, engineering problems and economics associated with the production of uh, three different type of uh, gases like uh, producer gas, water gas or blue gas which is also known as blue gas. It is known as blue gas because of the uh, flame color when it is burnt right? and then coke oven gas, the production process of these three gases that we have seen in the previous lecture. Now, in this lecture, we will be starting with production of a natural gas. Natural gas, major portion of natural gas is used as raw material in the chemical industries. Natural gas composition varies with location. Actually, you know, uh, this natural gas consists of primarily methane, but some traces of or some fraction of ethane, propane, butane etc. would also be there in addition to the moisture and then some sulphides. So, the moisture may be there in terms of like you know or the gas may be wet because of this moisture. So, before using it natural gas for the required heating purpose etc. then what you have to do? You have to dry it properly and then remove any heavy end products are there and then you should also remove H2S and then make it purify as much as possible. Then only you should use it for the heating purpose. Okay? It occurs either in association with petroleum crude or as non-associated gas. If it occurs as non-associated gas, it is called as free gas. If it occurs in association with petroleum crude, it is called as associated gas. Okay? Uh, from the wells, mostly you get the natural gas as a free gas if it is a natural gas well. If it is a petroleum crude well, then you get uh, this uh, natural gas along with the petroleum crude. So, then under such conditions, uh, if it is coming from the uh, petroleum well in association with the petroleum crude, then it is known as the uh, associated gas. Storage of natural gas can be done by several methods, those things like you know we have already seen several unit operations in the first week of the lecture. So, for the storage of natural gas often we use PO's, gas holders, liquefaction in cylindrical tanks or underground natural cavern storage etc. are predominant methods for the storage of natural gas. Okay? Now, we will be seeing the process description of natural gas production. In this natural gas production, there are three primary steps. One is the drying of the raw natural gas that we are getting from the natural gas wells or uh, petroleum crude wells. Then after drying, then uh, there may be some heavy end products may be there. So, those heavy end products should be removed and then after that uh, further purification should be done by removing the sulphide etc. So, these three stages are very essential in producing as much pure natural gas as possible. Okay? So, in addition to propane and butane, raw natural gas consists of undesirable water in the form of moisture or the gas may be wet and H2S which must be removed. Okay? So, how to remove? So, in order to remove this one, it is essential to dry the raw natural gas so that to remove the moisture etc. followed by removing of the heavy ends by absorption kind of techniques and then followed by purification of H2S uh, removal again by absorption kind of techniques before uh, we are putting it in transmission lines from which the gas is supplied to the uh, required points. Okay? So, drying can be done either drying by refrigeration or by passing through drying units. So, what are those units? Gas is pumped from natural gas and petroleum wells to drying units such as like absorption, adsorption or refrigerated compression. Okay? Then after that separation of heavy ends done by either absorption or liquefaction, two options are there. Adsorption can also be done, but adsorption has not found economic or it is not found competitive for this purpose of producing the natural gas, pure natural gas. Natural gas containing over 95 percent of methane with balance of ethane is next sent to purification units for removal of H2S and other types of sulphides if at all present. Okay? 
Various absorption and chemical reaction methods are available with the ethanol amine absorption processes in current favor, right? This uh, whatever the process uh, that I explained that same thing we are going to see by a uh, simplified uh, you know flow sheet. So, that is what we are having here. So, as I mentioned uh, getting purified natural gas is having three stages, one is the drying stage, then another one is heavy and removal stage, another one is the purification stage which is a last stage. Okay? So, the raw natural gas whether it is associated gas or free gas that you get from the wells, right? it is associated gas if you get it from the petrol crude wells, it is a free gas if you get from the natural gas wells. right? So, that gas should be dried first. Drying can be done by two ways, one is drying by refrigeration. right? Another one is drying by passing through this gas through different media like alumina, silica gel or passing through H2SO4 solution, glycerols or aqueous calcium chloride solution, etc. Right? So, once you do this drying, what are you doing? You are doing nothing but removing the moisture which is in the form of water you are removing. So, once you remove the moisture from the uh, uh, raw natural gas, then you will be having a dry gas which is still raw it is not purified. Then after that there are two options are there. So, these dotted lines in flow sheets often represent options, optional routes. Let us say start with the simplified one. So, if you wanted to produce liquefied petroleum gas also through the same process. In fact, actually LPG is a byproduct from the uh, natural gas production plant or from petroleum crude refining plants. Okay. So, now let us say this dry raw gas if you pass through a fractionator after passing through uh, some units like steam turbines etc. So, then in the fractionator what you can do? You can do a fractionation of the components whatever the components are present. So, let us say whatever the propane and butane components are there those things you separate in the fractionator and then take them to the LPG storage. Right? So, that is what happens, right? So now, this, like you know, in the same natural gas production section, we are getting LPG also, right? So this is one optional route, right? So that you can produce LPG also in the natural gas production uh, plant itself, right? Now, other route is absorption route, where you pass the dry gas through absorber, through an absorber for which straw oil you will be using as a kind of solution for absorbing the heavy ends because this dry raw gas whatever is there, it is free from moisture only, rest all, all things are still there. So, then high ends you have to remove, right? So, how do you remove them? By using straw oil. What is straw oil? Straw oil is nothing but a, a high boiling point fractions, high boiling point distillates coming out from the petroleum crude fractionator, right? That means, you know, some kind of a heavy products from the petroleum crude whatever you get. So, actually they can also be cracked further and then get some kind of products because petroleum crude is a kind of one resource, each and every fraction is having market value from chemical plant view, okay? So, those heavy ends you have to remove by using the straw oil which is again coming from the petroleum industry. Okay? So, now since you know that petroleum industry each and every fraction is important one, you cannot leave it. So, after uh, removing the heavy ends, uh, whatever the lean or uh, spent straw oil is there that you pass through a stripper section. right? From the stripper what you can do? You remove whatever the water etc. or whatever the heavy ends that you absorb in the solution they can be stripped off in the strip section and then uh, further you remove water from those sections. So, then those heavy ends, those heavy ends you can take in a fractionator, in a fractionator, okay? Whereas, the dry uh, natural gas after removing the heavy ends whatever are there that is after passing the observer you uh, believe that the heavy ends are completely removed. Uh, not believe, in fact, your operating conditions in the absorber, etc., should be maintained such a way that there should not be any heavy ends, right? After removing these heavy ends, so then whatever the gas is there, natural gas is there, that is almost 95 percent pure methane with some amount of ethane, etc., would be there. So, this 
gases after removing the heavy ends you will be having 95 percent pure methane with some amount of ethane and then some sulphide. So, that gas you have to take to a another absorber section right where you can remove the H2S where you can remove the H2S from the gas. So, then you get a purified natural gas that purified natural gas you can take to the storage section and then from there to pipeline transmission you can do it right. Here whatever the solution that we are using in this absorber column is ethanol amine solution right which is also having some market value. So, after when you use it for absorption of uh, H2S and other sulphides, so now it is contaminated. So, once it is contaminated rather throwing it what you can do you can send it through the stripping section because these ethanol amine solutions are also expensive you cannot uh, you know afford to throw uh, liters of tons of such kind of solutions ok. So, then what you do the spent solution whatever is there that you take to the stripping section and from the dilute solution or spent solution whatever spent ethanol amine solution whatever is there from there you separate out H2S so that you can get the pure ethanol amine again and that you can send back to the absorption column again ok. So, the heavy ends also you can what you can do you can take them to the fractionator from there what you can do uh, you can take out whatever the propane and then uh, uh, butane uh, fractions are there. So, they can separate out by fractionation you can separate out those fractions uh, by fractionator and then you take them to the LPG storage. So, this is how this uh, plant from the natural gas plant itself you can get the liquefied petroleum gas as well ok. So, now what you see here so the absorption stripping here and then fractionation that is nothing but distillation then again absorption stripping these kind of operations are there fractionation these kind of operations are there all these operations absorption stripping and then distillation you study in mass transfer operations course and then you can understand how much important are those concepts that you have learnt in mass transfer course or you are going to learn in your mass transfer course right. So, the bottoms that you get from the fractionator while processing the heavy ends they are nothing but uh, you can take them to the raw petroleum storage and then these are further can be processed to get more products from it. So, now you can see from the natural gas whatever we have whether it is associated with free gas then so many products you are getting not only purified natural gas and uh, LPG but also you are getting some raw petrol that can be further processed uh, to get more products from it ok. So, now next is liquefied petroleum gases that we have already seen anyway. However, these are byproducts from natural gas separation plants and petroleum refineries. They consist of purified propane and butane in various mixtures. Propane fraction is supplied only for residential fuel in winter climate because of its low or lower boiling point. And in the flow sheet of natural gas, production of LPG is also shown that we have already discussed. In the flow sheet what we have seen that possible physical steps such as separating moisture by drying and then H2S and then petrol that is raw petrol storage whatever is there that is nothing but petrol right. Choice of drying and separation depends on location and power cost, location as well as the power cost and also composition also. What is the composition of a raw natural gas that you are having? So, based on that one also these things are you know are going to change. So, drying can be done either by adsorption or refrigeration, heavy ends removal by absorption or refrigerated liquefaction also possible. Then natural gas as overhead is stripped off H2S in an ethanol amine absorption process right. So, the flow sheet is the same flow sheet that we have seen ok. Now, we are going to see few basics of synthesis gas and then how to produce synthesis gas by different approaches that is what we are going to discuss. Synthesis gas it is a variable mixture of CO and H2 and then it is used for synthesis of several organic components such as methane and then fissure drops that is paraffinic and olefinic hydrocarbons varying from methane to waxes along with few oxygenated components also by taking different CO to H2 ratio varying between 0.5 to 2. It can also be used for the production of synol which is straight chain normal alcohols by taking CO 
to H2 ratio between 0.3 to 2, 0.5. Then methanol can also be produced by synthesis gas if you take CO2 H2 ratio 0.3. Then higher alcohol synthesis is also possible. Isosynthesis that is saturated branched hydrocarbons production is also possible by taking CO2 H2 ratio 0.5. And then oxosynthesis that is oxygenated hydrocarbons, aldehydes uh, and alcohols something like that can also be produced by taking synthesis gas having CO divided by H2 ratio 1.2. Then obviously all these process require different catalyst, different temperature, different pressure conditions and then different process process right. So, it is not possible to get all of them by single process or right? using by a small narrow range of temperature or pressure or uh, using a single catalyst it is not possible right. So, different catalyst along with varying temperature and pressure conditions applied for synthesis of these organic components using synthesis gas ok. In some cases carbon monoxide is not needed and are labeled as ammonia synthesis gases having hydrogen and nitrogen or hydrogenation of coal only having H2. Since we are talking about synthesis gas, all synthesis gases contain H2, hydrogen, right? Whether it is ammonia synthesis gas or proper synthesis gas or water gas or coke oven gas, you can see that you now all of these are used for different synthesis purposes and then their H2 would definitely be there, okay? Majority of H2 produced in India is utilized for ammonia production. In addition, there are many organics associated with ammonia and petrochemicals where synthesis gas is used. So, n number of huge number of applications are there. So, in addition to production of various other hydrocarbons like ethylene, butylene, etc., naphtha is also used for production of syngas. Since we are going to use naphtha for production of syngas, we will have a, a few basics of a naphtha, what it is. Naphtha is generic term applied to refined or partly refined or unrefined low to medium boiling petroleum distillate fractions. They can be two types, aliphatic naphtha and then aromatic naphtha. Then what does mean by aliphatic and aromatic? Aliphatic means saturated or unsaturated non-cyclic compounds plus there may be a few cyclic compounds which are not aromatic, which are not aromatic. Something like N-alkanes which are also known as paraffins, isoalkanes, cycloalkanes, all of them are saturated hydrocarbons. Saturated in the sense you have the single bonds, okay? Whatever the bonds between C, H, etc. are there, all of them are single bonds. Then we call them saturated hydrocarbons. In fact, hydrocarbons in the sense hydrogen and carbons are there. In addition to this, there may be some other components like O, N, etc. So, if the all the bonds are single bonds, then we call them saturated hydrocarbons. N alkenes, which are also known as olefins, isoalkenes, cycloalkenes, and alkynes, which are also known as acetylenes, isoalkenes, cycloalkenes, etc., which are known as unsaturated hydrocarbons. If you have double bond or uh, triple bonds in the molecular structure of a component, then you can call them unsaturated hydrocarbon. Aromatics in the sense cyclic compounds with a, which are nothing but ring structured but having aromatic in nature. So, then we call them aromatic. In fact, entire organic components category may be grouped as two groups. One is the aliphatic group, another one is the aromatic group, okay? So, aliphatic naphtha is in the kind of hydrocarbon derivatives making up the solvents, example like paraffinic hydrocarbon derivatives and then cycloparaffins like naphthalenes, etc. These are obtained by distilling the crude oil. Then aromatic naphtha in the sense in the methods used for their production, etc. Aromatic such as alcohol substituted benzene, etc. So, the large quantities of naphtha is available for production of synthesis gas not only synthesis gas, in fact synthesis gas is a very small minor component because naphtha is a very generic term. So, but this naphtha is also used for production of other petrochemical primary materials such as acetylene, ethylene, propylene, butylene, butadiene, etc. and so on. So, 
and then processes for producing above uh, chemicals like this involve thermal pyrolysis of C2 and then higher saturates in the presence of steam with or without oxygen. Cracking is also another term used for such processes, example naphtha cracking, right. Next is production of syngas, we will see how many methods are available for production of the syngas. Classification of production methods, one is from petroleum hydrocarbons, another one is from coal and coke. From petroleum hydrocarbons you can produce syngas by reforming or partial combustion of hydrocarbons, right. From coal or coke what we can have? We can have water gas and coke oven gas. In fact, this water gas, syngas also if you see only CO and H2 are there. Sometimes in syngas CO2 may also be present, right? But in water gas only CO and H2 would be there. If the CO and H2 is produced from the coal and coke then they are called as water gas. But if the same CO and H2 gas mixture is produced from the hydrocarbons or naphtha then we call them you know syngas that is a uh, minor difference one should understand between syngas and water gas. So, since these things we have already seen in the previous class what we are going to see? We are going to see syngas production from hydrocarbons by reforming and partial combustion methods. Syngas or synthesis gas by steam reforming of hydrocarbons we will see now, we start with. So, the chemical reactions that are involved in this process are provided here. There are two types of reactions occurring here in this uh, process, reforming reactions and water gas shift reaction. In the reforming reactions what we have? We have alkanes and then it reacts with the steam in the presence of nickel catalyst, then what you get? You get carbon monoxide and hydrogen, right? CN H2N plus 2 is generic formula for the alkanes. If N is equal to 1 then it is methane. Let us say if you have n is equal to 1 then delta H naught for this reaction is plus 52 kilocalories. If you have n is equal to 6 then delta H naught is plus 238 kilocalories. That means as n increasing delta H naught is increasing in the positive side. More and more endothermic it is becoming, right? That means as you move towards to the higher alkanes what happened? Production of a syngas from higher alkanes becomes more and more tougher. That means you have to give more energy. Why? Because delta H naught is increasing. That means you know the enthalpy of the reactants is much smaller compared to the enthalpy of the product. So, then you have to give more and more energy, okay? Other possible reaction is that that CO and then H2 whatever are there. So, that may be reversibly forming uh, methane and then water with delta H naught as minus 50 2.0 kilocalories. Water gas shift reaction, the CO react with the water reversibly in the presence of iron oxide catalyst to produce CO2 plus 3H2 with delta H naught minus 9.806 kilocalories, right? So, now all these reactions are possible. So, then conditions, reaction conditions and then design of the uh, reactor etc. one has to be very carefully do so that desired product forms more rather than the other products or desired reaction progresses much better compared to the other reactions. So, raw materials required as we are discussing the production of a syngas from the naphtha. So, then obviously one of the raw materials is the refinery naphtha or off gases. Air is optional, then steam then small makeup quantities of uh, nickel and promoted iron oxide catalyst. In addition to that some solution for absorption like ethanol, amine and ammonia cuprous formates solutions, right? So, these are the raw materials. If you have these raw materials you can produce syngas. But how much quantity of these things are required? That depends on the basis, right? So, quantitative requirements basis. Let us say if you wanted to produce 100 normal cubic meters of hydrogen which is having more than 99 percent purity, then you need to have 21.9 kgs of naphtha, steam 560 kgs, fuel as naphtha 22.3 kgs, cooling water 6.5 tons, electricity 1.4 kilowatt hour. All these things are obtained by doing the proper material and energy balance for the plant flow sheet that we are going to discuss further in the few coming slides, okay? They are not you know rough values, they are based on the 
proper material and energy balance calculation for the production process flow sheet that we are going to discuss. Okay? Plant capacities, if you wanted to produce only H2, then 10 to 200 tons per day is possible. If you wanted to produce synthesis gas that is CO plus H2, more than 80,000 normal meter cube per day of synthesis gas one can produce, such big plants are available. Process description first we see and then we will go to the flow sheets. So, hydrocarbon feed is mixed with steam and fed to reforming furnace. Nickel catalyst is placed in vertical tubes of 3 to 4 inches in diameter and 20 to 25 feet long. So, in the reactor the tubic uh, like let us say if you have the reactor like this, right, you are allowing the gas to pass through actually. right? So, then a catalytic bed is required. So, in order to make bed, uh, so, why are you not having uh, you know just pouring in this catalytic particles in this one like a packed bed something like that, that may be question. right? So, that can be done, but the reaction temperature here is very high 1000 degree centigrade or something like that, approximately 700 to 1000 degree centigrade. So, at such high temperature, if the catalysts are you know mixed with sand etc., because these beds, catalytic beds are not made of purely catalysts, they are also mixed with some kind of a inorganic materials like sands etc. So, at that temperature, so other components may be interfering, right? So, if any impurities are there in sand, so they may be interfering with the process and then purity of the products may substantially decrease or separating the further impurities because of those sand other kind of material is going to be very tough and then economically not feasible. For that reason what you can have? You can have a column, you can have tubes, you can have n number of tubes like this of uh, let us say 3 to 4 inches in diameter and 20 to 25 feet long and then in these uh, tubes you put these catalyst particles like this so that so that there is no issue of impurities because of the foreign material etc all those kind of things okay so that is one reason so one has to be careful well selection you know otherwise unnecessarily you are increasing the steel tube cost if there are no reason why should you increase and then these are not small you know small diameter uh, reactors they are large diameter reactors and then if you have uh, 3 to 4 inch uh, diameter tube so how many tubes you need and all those things you have to calculate so there should be a proper reason for the selection so here in this region uh, why the nickel catalyst is not uh, placed as a bed along with sand particles is because of this region. So, now you can have steel tubes in the in that one you can put this nickel catalyst. Heat for endothermic reaction is supplied by combustion gas and then reaction temperature must be between 700 degree centigrade to 1000 degree centigrade. Thus, high temperature alloy steel is used for the tubes, for the tubes that these tubes are made of high temperature alloy steel whereas, the steel wall of furnace because this furnace is made up of the steel again. So, that furnace wall whatever is there that is also refractory lined. Okay? Space velocity should be maintained between 500 to 600 hour inverse which is very high. Space velocity is nothing but what? Mass rate of gas that is entering the, the furnace or the reactor per mass of catalyst. So, this space velocity calculation that we have seen in the first week, so that much you have to maintain. So, this is another very important design parameter space velocity. So, after reforming has been done that is whatever the reforming reaction that we have seen in previous slides. So, when you allow these uh, gases whatever the hydrocarbons in the gases form let us say you pass through the furnace which is having catalyst at uh, 700 to 1000 degree centigrade. So, then you know what happens the several gases not only CO plus H2, but also CO2 etc. may be there, there may be some impurities H2 etc. also there. So, these gases you know these whatever the effluent gases are there. So, they can be processed in three different ways depending on the what is your end product. End product is CO plus H2 or it is only H2 or it is ammonia synthesis gas. So, based on that one three different approaches are there. So, those things we are going to see now. So, now this is the flow sheet.
for the you know steam reforming process. steam reforming of hydrocarbons in order to get synthesis gas ok. So, what happens there is another product also here if you want to get hydrogen synthesis gas subsequent flow sheet we are going to see how to get ammonia synthesis gas from the same thing. So, whatever the hydrocarbon feed is there that is taken in the vapor form and then it is mixed with the steam at 20 to 40 atmospheres and then that is fed to the reforming reactor. Reforming reactor here it is having vertical tubes with nickel catalyst filled in and then this furnace is operating at 700 to 1000 degree centigrade and then fuel for this furnace that is because it has to burn. So, then there should be source how to burn how to generate the energy for that one that is done by using flue gases plus air. So, when this mixture of hydrocarbons and steam enters this reactor at such high temperature because the furnace or the reactor is at high temperatures and then there is also catalyst immediately those hydrocarbons will be producing different types of uh, gases including CO, H2, CO2, H2S etc. depending on the impurities. So, now those gases are you know further processed depending on what is your product. Let us say your product is synthesis gas because these gases are primarily having a CO plus H2 plus CO2 only there is no H2S because the hydrocarbon feed you are taking such a way that there is no sulphur in that one right. So, this mixture what you can do if you wanted to produce only synthesis gas having CO plus H2 then you can pass through an absorption column by taking this alternative approach right. In the absorption column you can use a potassium carbonate solution for the absorption purpose you can have this solution right. So, when you use this solution from the top and then you feed the gases from the bottom at approximately 90 degree centigrade and 25 atmosphere whatever CO2 etc is there CO2 gas is there that will be absorbed that will be absorbed by the solution and then almost pure CO and H2 synthesis gas is collected from the top right. So, now this potassium chromate solution has become diluted now you cannot throw it as it is. So, what you can do you can take that solution to the stripper section and then strip off the CO2 and then whatever the pure uh, potassium carbonate solution is there that you can take back to the absorption column again so that you can do the recycling of the same amount of the uh, solution for the absorption the process would be economic ok. Now, let us say uh, that is what that is about the production of a synthesis gas. Let us say if you wanted to produce hydrogen gas. So, then what you do these gases whatever are there that you take to CO converter chamber which is operating at 425 degree centigrade which is nothing but combustion chamber let us say right. So, here when you take these gases whatever the CO that is present in the effluent gases that will be reacting with the steam because steam is also allowed to this reactor at 350 degree centigrade. So, the CO will react with the steam in the presence of a iron oxide catalyst to give CO2. Once you have the CO2 the, the process is same then again you take this one the effluents the follow the same process of taking them to the absorption column right absorb the CO2 etc. So, then after that mostly you have H2 rich gas. 95 percent or 99 percent etc. If at all some amount of uh, with uh, minor or minute amount of CO is there. So, that you wanted to remove. So, what you can do that gas you take to the methanation reactor which is operating at 300 to 400 degree centigrade and 8 atmospheric conditions. So, here because of the methanation you can remove the CO and then H2 would be further purified and then that H2 you can collect as a H2 synthesis gas. Okay. So, out of three alternative uh, routes after the uh, reforming reaction two we have discussed one is the production of synthesis gas another one is the production of hydrogen synthesis gas right. Next one is uh, we will be discussing uh, ammonia synthesis gas, but whatever we have seen in the previous slide same thing is presented here as a uh, description for CO H2 synthesis gas the effluent reformer gas is cooled to 35 degree centigrade and pumped to a hot potassium carbonate system to remove CO2 simply. For H2 gas 
what we have done? Water gas shift converter used to remove CO by reacting CO with water or steam so that to get CO2. So, then the effluents uh, from there would be having more H2 and then plus CO2 okay, with less CO, almost negligible CO. So, by this reaction. Okay. So, what happens? Whatever the CO is there that is unreacted CO. Okay. So, reformer gas is quenched with steam to give 350 degree centigrade input gas to catalytic converter using iron oxide catalyst promoted with the chromium oxide for this reaction. Then space velocity is this much is maintained. After scrubbing CO2 traces of CO if at all present they are removed by the methanation reaction. Okay. For high purity almost that is 99.9 percent H2, one or two additional stages of shift converter along with the CO2 absorber combination are added. Absorber with either ammonical cuprous formate or molecule sieves used to remove residual CO and CO2 down to 10 ppm or less yielding high purity H2. This is for if you wanted to get the pure H2. So, this is the second alternative. Third alternative is for ammonia synthesis gas. Correct amount of nitrogen is added via air and oxygen is burned out by H2 in nickel catalyzed combustion chamber inserted immediately following the reformer, immediately after following the reformer. Whatever the previous main flow sheet that we have seen in the previous section where we produced CO plus H2 as one product and then H2 as another product depending on the option what you want. There after the furnace chamber whatever uh, section is there immediately you put one combustion chamber right? so that you can burn out whatever the oxygen that is present in the air and then you get the nitrogen alone and then that nitrogen further purified along with the hydrogen in a similar way to get the nitrogen and ammonium in the required fractions for synthesis of the ammonia. Gases are cooled to 350 degree centigrade by water quench tower and then passed to shift converter except for N2, additional N2 which passes through the remainder of process is same as H2 preparation that we have seen. So, that is if you redraw it once again, so whatever the hydrocarbon in vapor form are there, they are mixed with steam and then fed to the reformer reactor. So, this is the reformer reactor. This reactor is having nickel catalyst and then operating at 700 to 1000 degree centigrade. For this reactor flue gas and air are supplied in order to have the required energy and then whatever the effluents that are coming from the reformer are having CO, H2, CO2, etc. So, now here what you do? You allow the air and then pass it through the combustion chamber which is again having the nickel catalyst. So, then whatever uh, O2 is there from the air that will be that O2 will be burned out by the H2. Okay? Then you will be having only H2, N2, CO and then CO2 only. So, then what you do? You can pass through this quenching these gases because the gases coming out of this combustion chamber would be at high temperature. So, these gases you have to scrub with the water or cool down using the quenching water tower okay, like this. Then after cooling this one you reduce the temperature to 350 degree centigrade. Those gases are sent to CO shift converter. Now, here CO shift converter when you use whatever the CO is there that will react with the water and then it will give CO2 plus H2. The references for this lecture are provided here. Thank you.